Hey, what's up, and welcome to Movie Dumpster Season 6, Episode 16. Today we're talking about Silent Night, Bloody Night, from 1972, directed by Theodore Gershney. Is this the first Christmas horror movie ever made? We're going to find out. I'm Joe Lascola. And I'm Sean O'Rourke. Welcome to The Dumpster. We are trashing back through the snow, Joe. It's that time of year again here in the dungeon and around it's the world. It's Christmas time in the dumpster. <laughs> in the dungeon. There you go. Uh, well, what is the MDU version of that? Is there like a uh, like a like a Ghostbuster situation when there's like a a ghoulish like bang in front of like a, a fireplace? Uh, probably. You know, so it, be good for yeah. goodness' yeah. sake. Whoa, <laughs> Munchie's coming. <laughs> Munchie, Munchie, and the ghost of of Bing Crosby's coming. Probably. Apparently. Yeah. You, oh, dude, Ooh. you think you know what? Munchie would be like, yeah, I wrote all of Bing Crosby's songs, right? He taught him how to credit for taught it. him how to croon, right? Yeah, yeah. I, we did do that mini sode, uh, which actually was a episode on the main feed uh, before we went into the video version of the show. Of actually, speaking of Ghostbusters and and uh, Bing Crosby or something Christmas specials, uh, the one where they did the uh, the Christmas Carol kind of thing. Yes, my point of bringing that up is, I wonder if they were involved in some capacity with the shenanigans in that episode of Real Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh, like they went back in time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but yeah, before we get into the axe wielding and obscene phone calls, uh, if you want more movie dumpster content, you can head over to patreon.com slash movie dumpster. You can get an ad free audio version of the show for just two bucks a month, and you can support the show for as little as two bucks a month. So uh, that'd be great if you can do that. And for no money at all, you can like this video if you're watching on YouTube and share it with your friends. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast app, leave us that five star review. It uh, really helps get us out of the bottom of the dumpster and into more eardrums, eyeballs, and everything in between. You know, we want to grow this dumpster community, so get more folks in here. Absolutely, man. And if you want to stay up on the haps of what's going on with the Dumpster Boys, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster on your favorite social media platforms, or you can head over to MovieDumpsterPodcast.com. we got all kinds of goodies there. You'll see the uh, latest episodes, uh, where we're going to be if we have events coming up. Um, there's even a store there. You know, get yourself a stock and stuff, or, you know, maybe one of those sweet uh, dumpster uh, knit caps or possibly a Trash in the Snow t-shirt. It's possible. Go check it out. Uh, is this, like you just said, is this the first horror movie or Christmas themed horror movie. So that's what I thought. I thought this was the first Christmas horror movie of whatever. But then there's Who Slew Auntie Roo, which comes out the same year, nine months before it in the UK. But the other caveat to that is this movie was made in 1970 and wasn't released until 1972. Oh, so it's one of those. Yeah. Sat on a shelf for a little while. So publicly... It's the second one, but on but in true in truth, it's the first Christmas horror movie. Okay, okay, that's kind of interesting. Now, have you seen that other film, or I you have just read about it? Okay, I have okay. Not. I, I I've I've heard of it. I've never actually seen it. So this movie's made in 1970, and the working title for it was Zora. Okay, like Zora's Domain, like <laughs> like from like, Legend of Zelda. From Legend right, of yeah. Zelda, yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know why it was called that. I have no idea whatsoever. Not even a character in it named Zora, but okay. No connection whatsoever to anything that's involved in the movie. But then it's Silent Night, Bloody Night. But it's released theatrically, so so it sits on a shelf for two years, and they release it theatrically as Night of the Dark Full Moon. They must have heard us talking about full moon in 2023. <laughs> the reverberation oh, yeah. went Is back what, to the 72. John Hurt, baby, that's what's going on here. Uh, no, no, no. That that name makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Sometimes I could sit here and try to put the pieces together on these names that don't work, but this one, I ain't got a single iota. I, I have no clue how that one even relates <laughs> to this film. So yeah, Maybe if there was a werewolf, but there are no fucking werewolves in this. <laughs> so it's released theatrically in 72 as Night of the Dark Full Moon, then it gets re-released in 1973 as Silent Night, Bloody Night. And then Did that do better for him? I guess so. And then it's released one more time in 1981 as Death House. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Silent Night, Deadly Night. No, no, no. But no. yeah, Death House, of course, <laughs> obviously. So uh, okay, it's 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 got a bizarre history. There's also a thing where this sh shortly after this film was made, it fell into public domain. So that's usually what happens with stuff like that. Okay, um, which is also why you we we can't seem to find a really good. 
copy of it. I mean, you can get a widescreen presentation of it, but like it's not it it needs to be cleaned up. Yeah, we talk about the transfers a lot on this yeah. show, and usually that they're really good. But this yeah. is a case of one that just needs one of those really good transfers. This could really benefit from it, man. This is a very important movie. I feel like in the genre, it's uh you can watch it on Tubi, and it's not that it's bad. Like it, it's I, I guess I don't know if it's a DVD rip or a VHS rip or what. Like it's fine. But there's a couple scenes, like especially towards the end when it's darker out, when they're outside mm-hmm. doing a few things, and you're like, I kind of know what's happening, but I really can't see anything. So I hope I'm not like missing like a visual storytelling cue. <laughs> but it's it's not as bad as like a home sweet home or anything. Right. But it's like, man, I really wish I could see a little bit better. I want to say Code Red put out oh. a, a DVD like a while ago. Okay, okay. I mean that the print that's on Tubi now is better than the VHS okay, for yeah, sure. Yeah. And then I mentioned that like it comes out again. It's released, re-released theatrically in eighty one. Yeah. yeah, in nineteen eighty one. But like in nineteen seventy eight, this is part of uh, WWOR TV's like yearly holiday lineup, which I believe was part of CBS uh, WRR uh, TV's uh, Fright Night, which was like their horror show that they used to do um, on that television station, and um, they would run it. Every year for Christmas, like at night. <laughs> okay. And it was successful. Like people like watched it a lot. I never watched okay, it because okay. I wasn't alive in 1978. Oh, well, that's, that's that <laughs> solves that one. <laughs> sure, there you go. You would have been right up there with the popcorn bucket and everything. I just thought that was, I thought that was interesting because like even then, yeah. people were hungry for a Christmas horror movie to be okay. played on the late night channels. You know what I mean? So they just take whatever they can get is that what you're implying? Well, well not, not take... <laughs> I'm, take, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Not take whatever you can get, but it was such like a... Uh, there was a need for it. People well, wanted it. It was yeah. so niche at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Now there are fucking... You know, Christmas Hart movies are a dime a dozen. You know what I mean? They come out every fucking year. But like, again, this is the first one to ever be made. Uh, this film, I, I like... The Christmas is kind of central to the plot, as you do find out. It literally takes place on Christmas Eve. Yes, but... Even though this sounds insane to even say, if you pulled that very important centerpiece out of this film, <laughs> this could kind of kind of take place whenever. Sure can. Uh, Thanksgiving even. Uh, yeah, literally. I, well, <laughs> Valentine's speak, Day. Speaking of Thanksgiving or even My Bloody Valentine, I feel yeah. like those films kind of have more uh, uh, of their holiday injected into their film than this sure. one. This is definitely one that, even though, again, I just said it's important to the actual the the plot. Uh, a lot of the Christmas elements are more window dressing in this one. A hundred percent. But it is Christmas time in the city for sure. Yes. So we did mention this last year in our uh, To All a Good Night episode. Okay. Uh, which was, To All a Good Night was the film directed by David Hess. It was the first Christmas, sl- not only the first slasher movie of the 1980s, but the first Christmas slasher of the 1980s. Uh, right, yeah, because it was like in January or something yeah. like that, right? So we mentioned Silent Night, Bloody Night. We also mentioned Black Christmas, but we're we're, we're going to get that to that in a second. Okay. And if you're and if you're familiar with our Black Christmas episode, which we also did cover, uh, we talk a little bit about that being a proto slasher and sure. being one of the first ones. And it is one of the first ones, but it's not the first one. No. That distinct honor goes to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. That is the yeah. proto slasher. Um, there's no arguments being made. I I did I research. I really researched it because I was like, are you are, are you to sure? See what the consensus was. The consensus yeah. is that Psycho is the proto slasher. I could see that because I was even when I was looking at my Black yeah. Christmas because I watch it every year uh, on Black Friday. I was looking up like, huh? Has the opinion like the general consensus changed on this at all? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people are just calling it a slasher now. Yeah. And I, I know we had that debate on that episode and probably in other episodes over the years of doing the show. But that's kind of funny how like just what you just said. For years I was like, yeah, that's a proto slasher. But now I actually just think it might just be a slasher. Um, just to kind of go off the what you just said about this film. Well, proto slasher meaning that the ty- the, the the term wasn't. Invented, yet. right? Or, or or psycho, I guess is yeah, psycho, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah psycho. Yeah. But like when I was a kid, just for the sidebar, like yeah, yeah. when I was a kid, I thought Psycho was a slasher movie because of all the other films that have come after it and how what it kind of evolved into as a genre. Yeah, because they yeah. weren't trying to make Hitchcock wasn't trying to make a slasher; he was trying to make a, a scary movie. scary movie with yeah. some tension and yeah. some uh, psychological thriller, I mm-hmm. guess. I, I, but I would argue that most slashers are psychological, psychological thrillers. thrillers. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, a lot of them are not all yeah. of them, but some most of them um the case with silent night bloody night it is the case with black christmas it is you know uh True. halloween yeah you well, know right, yeah. you know what i mean halloween definitely is the one that kind of finally gets like the main formula figured out that a lot of these movies kind of 
pick from going forward, but... Uh, I, I'm going to disagree and say that Black Christmas was... I was going to say the same breath. Oh, oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Those Black, are the two. Black Christmas Friday is... Friday the 13th, those are kind of like three that come to mind for me. Even though... Well, we're going to get to Black Christmas. We're not there yet. Sure, sure. <laughs> but I want to mention Psycho because Psycho... Uh, is the proto slasher for the genre. Yeah, did, sorry, which, I didn't mean to get too far away no, from no, that. No, 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 it's okay. But it also has heavily, not not necessarily Psycho specifically, but Alfred Hitchcock uh, specifically influenced Bava, which would in turn birthed the Giallo. I could totally see that, because if you watch a lot of his movies, even like Birds... Uh, has those those certain camera angles that are very reminiscent of giallos and slasher films. So I never knew that, but that's something to uh, to chew on. That's a good thing to think about. I never even yeah. thought of that. In fact, I think Psycho might have directly influenced Bava <sighs> for it had to, for right? the first giallo. So what's considered the first giallo is a Bava film. It's called The Girl Who Knew Too Much, which is a play on uh, one of Alfred Hitchcock's uh, movies. Man Who Knew Too Much. The Man Who Knew yeah. Too Much. Um, and that came out in 63. And that's that has the title of First Giallo. Giallo, okay, yeah. yeah. So you have Psycho in 59. Hmm. I think Psycho's 59. So you have Psycho, or 1960. I think it's 59 or 60, right? Yeah, something like that. Um, so you have Psycho, and you have Bava's uh, The Girl Who Knew Too Much in 63. So you have this V we split off to the American slasher and the Italian slasher, i.e. Giallo. Giallo, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Or the criminal, like a giallo, and again, we've talked about this on other episodes, yeah. but like, Suspiria is not a giallo movie. No, that's just a straight horror okay, film. That is a, that is Italian horror film, but like specifically things that deal with whodunit, uh, crime elements, and uh, slasher uh, attributes, um, but ultimately it's just a person. There's no supernatural element, I guess is what right. I like to say. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. A lot of times people, just with the Italians in general, yeah. I feel like, if we, we, I don't know if we talked about it on the show before, because yeah. we haven't actually covered uh, an Italian film somehow we haven't gotten there yet. Maybe next year that's oh. where we got to scratch a few off. Oh, we're fucking going in on it uh, next year, baby. But yeah, to to Joe's point, Giallo films are usually not supernatural. I mean, kind of like a tourist trap. I could think of maybe like one or two if I really scratch my head. But generally speaking, yeah, they're just the person in gloves, typically wearing a hat or something, killing people. Uh, usually coeds, but not exclusively. And then slashers, you know, obviously are what they are. And I feel like there's there can be a who done it element, but it's not a requirement in slashers. Whereas giallo, that is kind of the bread and butter element to them. That's the whole point. Yeah, is it's a crime thriller with exactly with with slasher elements. That's yeah. what a giallo is. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was so interesting um, because I was off base. Mm. in my research so finding that out i was like or my thought or, or right, what yeah, i yeah. what i thought it was i was like oh wait no wait a second there was mm. still like this is the jump off point yeah 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 however it is the first christmas slasher movie before mm. slasher was a thing so this is a proto christmas slasher okay how, how is that yeah i'll okay? take it this film directly influenced bob clark's black christmas ah you could see it and it's dripping with stuff yeah. that bob Cherry picked for from it. Cherry picked, and uh, we'll get into it like we always say. But and perfected, it, it perfected, and improved for sure. Uh, and like my, my the thought I was going to finish from before was Black Christmas is the perfect slasher movie in my opinion. It is yeah. the, it is perfect. It's a perfect horror film. It's a perfect yeah, psychological wow. thriller. It's a perfect slasher movie. It's it's all of the above. It's it's a perfect horror movie. It's definitely in like the top tier of horror movies, period, especially slashers. And just to that point, like I feel like Black Christmas as a whole set more of a precedent for a, the contemporary slasher as we know it. So whereas Hitchcock and Bava birthed the genre, mm. respectively, Black Christmas shaped it into the blueprint for what's to come later. Yeah. John Carpenter is directly inspired from Bob Clark and Black Christmas to make Halloween. And then people say that Halloween's the quintessential slasher movie in which people jumped on top of that. Then you get your clones and the eight and the early 80s boom of slashers like we talked about. Uh, like we talked about on the burning episode where right. you have like Halloween is 79 or 78 rather, excuse me. And then you have Friday the 13th, you have Madman, you have um, the, Prowl the Prowler, you have Maniac, you have all these films coming out within like three years of each other. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Silent Night, Bloody Night walked so that Black Christmas could run and the slasher genre as a whole exploded. Yeah. Uh, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it even has those, uh, I forget if I already said this, but it has some giallo elements in it too. It definitely, 
It didn't know exactly but it, what it wanted to be because it, it it wasn't established yet. Yeah. But again, by that point, there's not that many out. Right. Wow. 63 is the first Giallo. So you have 63 to 72. And in that window, I don't quiz me on this because I don't know exactly what came out, but we don't even get um, Bird with the Crystal Plumage until like 71. Oh, uh, well, okay then. So it's like the year before. I'm just thinking the killer, not that you have to immediately think Giallo because they're wearing gloves and, and a black jacket, but that's where my brain goes from watching so many of these damn films over the years. And the POV shots, actually. I'm going to say yes. Yeah. But. Even that was kind of in its infancy, Yeah, no, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless T- Theodore Gershney watched Bird with the Crystal Plumage, you know what I mean? I mean, he did go on to write, if I read that correctly, six Tales from the Dark Side episodes and directed five, oh, so... Oh, we're going to talk about that, but okay. I just mean <laughs> I just mean in the vein of uh, crime slasher, yeah, yeah. you know, film, and giallo films. He, he is a, uh, a student of the genre, for mm-hmm. sure, I guess is where I'm coming from by bringing that up. So, actually, that was perfect because I was just about to get into that. Okay. So, okay. so, so Theodore Gershney um, has been on the show multiple times <laughs> um, because, like you said, yeah, he directed a bunch of Tales from the Dark Side and Monsters episodes. Yeah, so what, yeah. So, what do we got? Let's let, let's rattle these off. We got In the Cards, <laughs> Ring Around the Redhead, Distant Signals, Ursa Minor, and two we haven't gotten to yet because they're in the third and fourth season, which are uh, My Own Place and Going Native. Okay. Um, and then two episodes from Monsters, which we haven't done. He directed one of the best episodes of Monsters, in my opinion. Holly's House. Okay. I remember you mentioning that one before. It's a great one. It's a really good one. And uh, he also did Museum Hearts, which I'm not... I'm trying to remember which one. I think that has to do with vampires or mummies or something. Maybe I'm misremembering that. We'll get to it. Mummies. Mummies. And just uh, one other little uh, pin I want to put in this is that he was at one point married to Mary Warrenov, who stars in this film. Oh, okay. Miss, Mrs. Potterman, dude, from Terrorvision. Oh, is that who that is? Yeah. Uh, Diane in this film? Is that who it? Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, the that's connections. Her. Yeah, so I wanted to just, I, I mean, she's in a ton of films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she's even in an episode of Monsters, but um, I just wanted to bring up Terrorvision because we actually covered that one, which she is in. Uh, you got to have the full moon connections, of course. Well, that's Empire. Empire. Excuse me. Empire, yeah. Uh, but she's in like rock and roll high school and um, a bunch of shit. Okay, <laughs> she's good in this. She's great. Uh, Death Race two thousand, like uh, she's okay. in a, the original one, yeah, you know, with Dave Carradine. Yeah. Um, so this is written by Theodore Gershney, Jeffrey uh, Convitz, and Ira Teller. But I wanted to mention uh, Jeffrey uh, Convitz because he also wrote and produced The Sentinel. Have you seen that? No. Oh man, we're like. It's a it's an apartment building uh, that is built on one of the gates of hell, and there is this person who protects the, this gate of hell to keep it closed or whatever. It's really good. Um, we should totally tackle that at one point. Like he's the sentinel. Well, or the person protecting the gate is the sentinel. I guess correct. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's really good. I'll, I'll put it on my watch list. It's very good. And that's that's pretty much it on the on the trivia's if you will for this for this film um <clears throat> the music's by Gershon Kingsley and it's really fucking good it's good yeah it's effective at it, setting a scene it actually sounds kind of akin to black christmas those those piano those weird piano chords a little bit not like verbatim but no, i feel I can like see it though you know what yeah I mean? it's creepy and i think it's well i think it's well executed it's also, the last thing I want to mention is that it's co-produced uh, by Lloyd Kaufman. I, I couldn't believe that. I was like <laughs> looking for the Troma logo somewhere on this thing. I couldn't find it, but yeah, Lloyd is involved. Uncle Lloyd. I don't know if Troma was even a thing yet. Troma but... is like late 70s, it comes around, I'm pretty but, but, sure. But Theodore Gershney convinced yeah. Lloyd somehow to open up his fucking you know, purse uh, book and uh, got some money. Hey, what the hell, right? Hey man, I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty interesting in the again like just just like in the lineage of what like Lloyd has been attached to. Right. Oh yeah. It's pretty incredible. So there's a remake of this movie, and there's a sequel to this movie, and the remake um, is called Silent Night, Bloody Night, The Homecoming, which is basically just like a retelling of this. I've never seen it. Uh, Spider Man's in that one, obviously, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Tom Holland's there. <laughs> yeah, the the fucking lizards there. <laughs> He's the guy. He's the killer. Yeah, obviously, yeah. of course. Doc Connors, of course, with a Santa hat. Yeah, because it, it's Christmas. <laughs> and then there was a sequel made uh, called Silent Night, Bloody Night Two Revival. <laughs> Where's he going on tour? I don't know. Revival <laughs> tour. <laughs> Keep on. Yeah, yeah. John Fogarty's in that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Silent. Yeah, Cre- yeah. Creedence Clearwater, Silent Night, Bloody Night Revival. Yeah. 
I, I guess considering how this film ends, maybe there's some kind of uh, necromancer involved, uh, hence the revival. Everything I've but read, I don't know. Everything I've read about the sequel is just nonsense. Like, mm. didn't need to happen. Kind of. Well, I clearly didn't need to happen, but like forced and like doesn't even make sense uh, with the pre-established lore of the first movie. So it's like, what the fuck are you like even shoehorned doing? Shoehorned like a motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Silent Night, Bloody Night. Can you please plot crunch this for the folks at home? So this is a movie that, again, like we kind of said a little bit going into this, that it's not quite a slasher, not quite a giallo, but it is absolutely a horror movie that takes place on Christmas Eve. And I say that because there is this kind of hidden killer uh, that is inside this haunted house, if you will. Uh, basically, this abandoned mansion. The that, Spencer Mansion. It kind of is like <laughs> the Spencer Mansion from Resident Evil, but uh, the owner, Butler, uh, is trying to sell it, Jeff Butler, and uh, someone or something is also living in this house and murdering everyone that decides to go in it for reason A, B, and C. We have the uh, the people that are trying to sell the house, people that are just trying to see if it's worth buying, and everyone in between, and uh, these, these victims that are kind of uh, taken out throughout the film. But there's also this kind of underlying uh, reason behind it all. It's not all just totally random, even though it might appear so in the beginning as we meet these kind of uh, townsfolk, including the mayor and the sheriff and the woman who runs the uh, communication line and uh, the mayor's daughter, Diane, and they all kind of come together. Uh, well, may maybe some of them get murdered unceremoniously, but they try to come together to find out who is doing the uh, murdering. And uh, we're also going to find out if uh, Jeffrey, young Jeffrey, can actually sell his uh, beloved uh, home that he's never set foot in. Jeffrey. Is there a pentagram in that mansion? Uh, I think uh, it, there might be, actually, <laughs> because uh, this movie, there's kind of just this air about this mansion throughout that. Well, is it haunted? Did someone die there? What is wrong with this mansion? People, Why does no one want to go there? People definitely died there, but there's yeah. a super out natural element that's heavily hinted at that is just non-existent. Right, I, right. I think I think it's the I think it's the uh, it adds in the mystique of it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, like a supernatural f like because all these horrible things happen there that there's an air of possession or evil <laughs> well, uh, bestowed upon the mansion. You know what I'm saying? We, we get a VO right in the beginning from this character, Diane, which again, you find out later is the mayor's daughter. But Not she, literally haunted. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Right, right. But she's talking about, yeah, you know, Mr. Wilford uh, Butler, he, uh, you know, he had this <laughs> mansion, but he never lived there except for when he came home in 1950 on Christmas Eve and he ran out of the house like Harry and Lime on fire. Dude, Kevin McAllister got to his ass with the blowtorch. <laughs> That's how you're introduced to this situation. This woman walking down a path saying, yeah, this guy never came home before. And then when he did, he was lit on fucking fire. Uh, Let me tell you about it. Well, it's Mary Warnoff right out, right. right out of the gate, man, right out of the beginning. And um, she, she opens with the narration and she's like, this is the Butler Mansion. And some bad shit happened about a year ago. Let me tell you all about it. Um, and it caps off with like that in the beginning and the end, but then like doesn't make sense in the middle. We'll get to uh, it. They kind of like lose their own plot thread yeah. eventually, but it's kind of a shocking way to kick things off for yeah. sure. Seeing this guy just on fire. So it's Christmas Eve, nineteen fifty. Right, but 50. there's but like the events that happen in this house take place every Christmas Eve because we find out there's something happens in Christmas Eve, nineteen thirty five as well. Right, which is a major lore dump at the end yeah. that we'll talk about. Yeah, we'll but... get there. Um, so basically, what happens is, uh, like Sean had said, this guy Jeffrey Butler, who is the grandson of What's his name? Uh, Wilfred but Wilf Wilfred. Butler. Wilfred, but Wilfred Butler. Wilfred Butler. Wilfred Butler. God got diabetes. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. When you actually see what this guy looks like, he he was definitely given those vibes. He uh, he built the house. Uh, yes. Or, or you know, had it built rather. Well, he was he was building a goddamn uh, spaceship underneath the mansion there. <laughs> that noose means nothing, obviously, in the corner. Watch Clark. You gotta watch Clark and watch Jeffrey. And watch him good. Um, so yeah, no, uh, so yeah, so, so Jeffrey wants to sell the house finally because he needs a quick buck. We never find out why Jeffrey needs the money. Yeah, like, Diane asks him later and he's just, I need cash quick. And it's like, do you have like gambling debts? Are you like, you have a problem? Do you need to call like 1-800-GAMBLER or something? 
Uh, we won't spoil it yet, but the movie also really, really wants you to think Jeffrey is either the killer or is involved with the killer. Yeah. Uh, cause, uh, I have to say it's actually really well done cinematically where the way, the way this guy's kind of presented throughout the first time you see him, he's kind of like broke down off the side of the road. He's got a rage problem. And that's how it comes across, yeah. right? Like a blood, <laughs> literally like blood rage comes to mind. Well, so, he, so let me just say this real quick. Yeah, so, yeah, he, yeah. so, so he's trying to sell the mansion cause he wants yeah. to get the money. Um, so he's making his way back to the town and you see the characters kind of all cross paths because he, his lawyer is there at one right. point, which we'll talk about in a second, but let's talk yeah, about yeah, that yeah. since you brought it up. Jeffrey comes into town too and Mary Warrenoff like passes him. Mary Warrenoff, by the way, is the daughter of the mayor who we'll be introduced to in a second. Right. Which we don't know that yet. We just think it's a random passing like, yeah, yeah I'm not going to stop for this guy. You don't yeah. think anything of it Fuck at first. Fuck you. And he like... He, like, tries to flag her down, and she drives right past him, and then he, like, smashes his own windows with, like, a tire iron? He goes nuts, and you're like, yeah. okay. And, you know, well, you know what it was, Joe, actually. After she passed, that fucking ketchup lady drove by next and said, thanks for the ketchup from Keenan and Kel. That's what set him off. That's why he had to smash No, you, you know what happened? Ralphie was holding the hubcap full of bolts, <laughs> and he went, oh, fudge, and he got pissed, and they went, you know. Yeah, Jeffrey couldn't... went all over the road and he smashed his uh, windshield. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he couldn't fix that tire any longer. So yeah, he's gonna just destroy it's the car. Pissed. Yeah, uh, but yeah, they kind of want you to just right off the bat think, all right, you, you don't even know it's the the Butler character yet. You don't know for like thirty minutes into the film, you just no. think it's oh this weird guy. And they, like I said, he's not even weird. It's just they present him because it's like he's always covered in shadows or he has this kind of like scowl on his face. Yeah, like his he looks like Mick Jagger kind of a little bit, a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's yeah, he's dancing in the streets for sure. <laughs> but but he's played by James Patterson, who actually uh passed away on you know, that's horrible. He passed away from cancer like seven months after the they oh, wrapped God. this film. Um, so so that's pretty terrible. So we're not gonna make fun of him anymore <laughs> in this movie because he's really good. He is very good yeah. in this, yes. Uh, but we also get introduced to who you think, speaking of psycho, not to put the cart before the horse, but who you think is your lead, uh, Patrick O'Neill playing this uh, yeah. Carter character. Yeah, he's like this uh, adulterer lawyer who is like Selling trying to the, sell this mansion. Right, for Butler, and it's like this whole thing where they even have him like calling his wife at one point. And and, like, I love you, I love the kids. Yeah. I love the kids. I, I can't come home, honey, I'm, I'm working, and he's got his fucking side piece. Sorry. This girl that's like clearly like 15, 20 years younger just sitting on the couch like, oh, can we please just get to the sex? And he's like, well, the most uh, exciting part about the sex is the wait for the sex. I got to take my, I got to wait for the blue pill to cook in. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, wow, yeah, his blue chews, right. So, yeah, so he's there and he kind of gets introduced to the town folk. Now, the town right. folks there, John Carradine is there who can't fucking talk. He's ringing a bell. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Yeah, uh, to communicate. Um, and then we have the mayor. We have the sheriff, and we have the communications lady who, Tess, yeah. who's Tess. Um, and they're all gathered around, and they want to purchase the home and knock it down because it has this legacy attached to it they, that they want to separate from the town. Right. They they claim it's evil. Yes. You know, there's something wrong with that house. Well, I guess there kind of is. From the events that transpire there, I, yeah. that's what I meant before. So it's not literally haunted. It's not literally possessed, but it has a disgusting air about it a from all the events that have taken place. Right. Baggage. Not like bones where there literally was. Not only was it just there was evil shit going right. on there, there was straight up specters also. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a gateway to fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, yeah. This place just like, yeah, some dark, horrible shit happened here. Yeah. <laughs> So so he's there, and I, I like the switcheroo there because it feels like a psycho where you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna go with this guy for a while. So um, you kind of do for like the first half hour for a long for a pretty decent amount of time. So uh, I guess we'll just tie tie his loose end up. Yeah, real quick. yeah. So um, so yeah. So he goes to the house and he ends up spending the night, and the people are, and the, everybody in the town's like. You sure you don't want to stay at the Paradise Hotel? Like, we'll hook you up. We'll give you a free room. You can stay as our guest. He's like, no, I'm fine. Don't worry. Right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go fuck this German chick or Swedish chick or whatever she is over there. So he ends up going to the mansion, and they they hook him up with the telephone because they're like, hey, you're out in the middle of the sticks. Like, you need to telephone just in case anything goes wrong. Right. They test it out a couple times. Like, yeah. all right, everything's okay. We're nervous, but. Yeah. We got through. They're alive still. Whatever. And this mansion is beautiful. It's actually still standing. Oh, really? I believe it's in New York. Yeah. Um, if I remember, I read the wiki. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's not the huge, the biggest deal, but it'd be cool to go see because yeah. it's it's you know shot with it for the movie. But the interiors, I don't know if it was the same house, but they're it's fucking gorgeous in there, man. Like it's a beautiful mansion, and they kind of like walk through it, and yeah. kinda, you kind of get a feel for it. Before we get to their demise, 
I want to mention that like there's this hard cut to the scene where somebody escapes a mental institution. Oh yeah, we got to set that up because yeah, yeah that's why everyone's nervous. Yeah, is because yeah that person escapes from that. They, they don't tell you who because that's integral to the plot. Well, they say somebody escaped, but they right. don't. There's no name or like it's a. Uh... Well, I guess it's they, they might say a name, but then you find out later that the character that is attributed to yeah. the name is actually using an alias. A- anyway, someone escapes that's dangerous. It's more it's more like they read about how the house is being sold and they escaped. Yeah, it, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what it was. Like the news hit the thing and then right. they freaked out. Did you see this POV of them like running out of the mental institution with like a fucking wrench and just like beating oh, the yeah, shit out of people? Yeah, they steal a car. And they yeah. steal a car. It's really cool. Yeah, beats the shit yeah. out of all the orderlies. And, and it's all done POV, so it's really neat, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we go to the house now. And they break in. They break in because, oh, we can't get in. We can't get in. And we keep like cutting to, which made me think more Giallo than Slasher at the time period, at least, because I feel like a lot of Giallos in the 70s do this where you'll have the killer. It's a leather gloved killer. But the audience knows they're there because they'll have the shot of the POV of the killer like in a room just mm-hmm. breathing. And yeah. they do this a few times in the film. It's pretty effective. It's really creepy. And like, again, this was direct inspiration for yep. Black Christmas because like, they're, they're really, in this, yeah. yeah, they're in this mansion. And it's all POV. <laughs> and the killer's like breathing and shit the leather gloved hands are like going up banisters and like it's really cre- they're going over the pictures that are in the mansion because nothing's been touched right the pictures they keep looking at the pictures yeah. that- everything's been preserved uh, according to Wilford's will yeah, and even and even supposedly Butler tells uh, this, this Carter character Patrick O'Neill oh yeah the place is furnished but it's like literally one room well, it's furnished. There's 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 couches and yeah, well, shit, and there's a bed, and there's a table, a dining room table, and stuff. She has to look for a minute. She's like, I don't see any beds. He's like, Oh, he says it's furnished, and they find like this nice ass bed. Well, she went into one room. Ah, which well, is okay, room. fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, the the point being though, they're fucking like you said, and then you just see this POV shot of this person slowly walking and breathing down this hallway, which kind of made me think of like Resident Evil One, honestly, a little bit. Oh, kind of, like a yeah. zombie shambling yeah, down yeah. a hallway, and they just. Grab this door handle, whip this bitch open, and it's like Lizzie Borden going to town. Dude, it was shocking. Yeah. Right? Like, I was like, oh, they're already, go- oh, okay. Yeah. This door <laughs> swings open, and this fucking axe just plants itself like a 900 times. Like, it's pretty a graphic hits, yeah. for 1972 yeah. in the mainstream, rather. And the blood looks um, pretty good. Yeah. It looks really good. It doesn't have that, like, it's not viscous. tempera paint yeah. uh, look to it. It has, like, a dark red mm. look to it. It, do- it doesn't look fake. No, it doesn't. Um, yeah, so he, d- <laughs> he that axe comes down quite a bit um, into a hand, into a back, into a stomach. Uh, yeah, and then you know you're kind of like like okay, I guess they're dead, obviously. And then, they like read a passage out of the Bible and like put a crucifix in their hand, and you're like, okay, well, where's this going? I, I thought this was gonna be like, oh, it's a priest killer, but we really don't do anything else. Or with like, that. or like you need to be punished for right. it kind of adultery, kind of like yeah, kind of like uh, the Silent Night Deadly Night motif. Bit. You know what I mean? Although that movie establishes that way better, and this movie just sure. kind of makes you think that, but then does nothing else with no. it. So yeah, it's more just because they're in the fucking house. Yeah, that they yeah get as you axed. find out, yeah. and then like again, like the killer, he might have done this one other time, but they make a big point that when they get on the phone, they they call like the police station and they they whisper, and it's very creepy. Oh man, and that's where I think Bob Clark got some of those ideas for Billy. Billy's a lot more uh, random at the the crazy shit he says. Billy, Billy's, but it's it's very in- there's intent to it, and this character has intent to every word they say. Oh, specifically, Billy specifically is mm. like. Three different voices. Oh yeah, well it's, it's a split personality. It's voiced thing, by like three yeah. different people, and it's like manic and insane. Yeah, with also that those those cr- the creepiest parts about Billy are like when he says stuff just like regular, like yeah. I'm going to kill you. Like that's weird. That's the creepiest part. Yeah, yeah. And but, yes! yeah. Billy. Um, but the killer in this is posing as a well, woman right. named Marianne. Right, there is that also. And they whisper like this. Hi, Marianne. Come to the mansion and we'll let's have a reunion, motherfucker. Uh, which then, like, the, when they talk to the sheriff, he's like, "Can you please speak up?" And they're like, "I can't. I'm sick. I'm sick. Come, 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 see me. Come, see me. Come to the mansion." You get those like hairs up on your yeah. arm a little bit. It's terrifying, yeah. and it reminded me a lot of the way that the creature. I know we just talked about it in Dolls about don't be afraid of the dark. Okay, uh, but the the way the creatures. Uh, speak in that film that's how they talk oh. and that's what makes it so like oh, oh. yeah 
Um, but yeah, so so basically what's happening is the killer starts lining up all of these people they're victims to come to the mansion mm-hmm. and they're they're bringing them there. He, he gets the share or they get the sheriff rather um, by uh, saying that they're sick. And oh, it's me, Jeffrey Butler. And I need you to come down to the yeah. mansion because my lawyer fucked up or whatever. He's not here. But then he tells or they again, it's a male voice, but they keep calling themselves Marianne over yeah. the phone. They say to the Tess, who's like, because the way those phones used to work back who's in the, the day. Who's the operator. Right, yeah. exactly. When the sheriff hangs up, the operator's still on the line. It's like, honest to goodness, like, unplugging and plugging in, yep. how do I direct your yep. call kind of thing. But he specifically tells Tess, I'm Marianne. Like, yeah. he doesn't mention that to the sheriff, and then she starts freaking out and tries to call the sheriff back, but the sheriff already left. Yeah. And she's like, ah, oh, fuck, well, uh, okay, this is a problem now. Tess, I want to see you, Tess. Come to yeah. the mansion. Uh, I, the sheriff really wishes he got that call because he finds some rando or what he thinks is a rando like Dr. Frankenstein in the fucking graveyard <laughs> and he's like what so, the hell is going on over here you just see like the POV of someone digging in a, in a grave That's that was great though yeah, yeah. like so 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 all these people are en route to the mansion yeah and um, and yeah like Sean said they're like dig, they're like burying somebody out in the middle of the, the cemetery yeah I, you know as you're watching the movie you can kind of assume it's the killer but it, it isn't flat out said it's just kind of an implied thing. I mean, thing. it's the shoes. It's the yeah. gloved hands. They have a shovel. Oh, they're it, they're, they're also breathing heavy. They're also dictated by this oil lamp that they carry around the house to light things. Right, right. Um, we also forgot to mention that, like at one, like when before the act scene uh, of the lawyer, they're like in a closet with yeah, the yeah, lamp. Yeah, yeah. It's really creepy, and I he's like that, listening and watching them. Though that, that's what I was saying when they were like, it, like you just have this POV shot of someone in a room while there's characters in a different room talking. And you just kind of hear the echo, fucking, and there's just sitting like, there. Breathing. It's, it's, it's cre- so it's creepy. creepy. Yeah. Um. Yeah. When they're like looking down the stairs, and when they're downstairs, like playing the piano in the beginning. Anyway. Uh, so the sheriff's like, "What the hell's that light out there in the middle of nowhere?" And, Where he pulls up, they get the fuck out of there. You yeah, think? Yeah. <laughs> they, oh, he gets straight like Evil Dead, man. When oh, he yeah. gets fucking shovel beat. He gets it in the neck and then beaten to death with the shovel, yeah. which I didn't even realize that was the sheriff at first. I thought that was like rando cop. Yeah. And then later, like, Diane comes up and is like, oh, the sheriff. And I'm like, well, yeah, oh. Well, that's why he's going out there to the right. mansion. But, like, I guess, like, the killer was like, oh, shit, they saw me. Like, this wasn't supposed to happen. Like, they were supposed to be at the mansion, but all right, I guess I, I guess you're going down here. Yeah, I mean, coming to find out later that the sheriff was on the hit list anyway, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. So about this time, um, we get reintroduced to Mary Warrenoff. Right. And she's like wrapping Christmas presents and stuff. Also, by the way, who the fuck wraps a Christmas present on a chair on a couch sideways? Well, you know what that was? That was another bird cage for Tess. Because Tess, <laughs> like, go to Tess's house later. She's got like twenty bird cages with birds in them. Yeah, uh, but I think that's what that was supposed to be. Yeah. But I was thinking the same thing. Don't what? feed that woman's addiction. She's got no. a bad habit. She's no. she, she's a bird hoarder. I, I do kind of love uh, Diane's reaction to a strange car pulling up after hearing a maniac's loose. Immediately goes for the revolver. Hey, that's like the smartest thing yeah. she could have done. Yeah. She took that gun out and was like, who is it? Come on in. Uh, she's one of those rare smart characters yeah. in a horror movie because later even there's a part where she's like shaking and another character's like, are you okay? And she's like, no, I'm just cold. I'm, I'm, cold. I'm not nervous. I'm fine. Yeah. I was like, oh, uh, okay. So she's so so it's Jeff Butler and right. she's about to blow him away. <laughs> and he's like, uh, I'm just selling my mansion. Like I went to the sheriff's office, but nobody was there. <laughs> By the way, thanks for just driving past me. It was <laughs> Fucking 20 degrees out. And she's like, yeah, well, you look like a fucking creep, so I didn't stop. And he's like, yeah, I guess I do look like a creep. She's like, can I see your license? There's a maniac on the loose. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he First he gives her some shit, but then he gives her his license, and he, she's like, ah, oh, California. That's good. He's like, yeah, you want to see my maniac license now? They gave it to me on the way out of the asylum. <laughs> He said some shit like that. He's like, well, they point, they paint a thing on your car. Yeah, yeah, like fucking with her. Because he steals, he like takes the lawyer's car. We st- yeah, from the house. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, well, I brought it here because uh, he wasn't there and the door was locked. So, and I'm like, yeah, because he's probably inside sleeping. Right. Because it's the middle of the night and you just took this guy's car. And he's like, he's basically like, I don't give a shit. I'll well, give it. I'll get it back to him. I'm gonna drive this sweet Porsche around for a little while. I think even Diane says that yeah. to him. Like, yeah, what if he needs his car? Oh, uh, well. He's like, he'll find it eventually. And again, like the movie really is starting to like plant those seeds because you don't really know what the yeah. fuck's happening yet. Yeah, and and you're kind of like, who is it? And it's like, you know, we we talk about uh, Wilford's daughter, whose name is Marianne, and you're like, right. okay, so. 
Did she survive? Is she there? Is it Jeff? Is it like a Norman Bates situation? Like what's what's happening? And like the way this guy plays it, you kind of are thinking that throughout a lot of it, yeah. which I guess brought out of the film in that respect. Yeah. So it, it does keep you guessing for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, up until the up until the last moments, in my opinion, I didn't expect. I didn't see the twist. Coming. Yeah. Who who it actually is? Yeah. It, it's kind of shocking once yeah. it acts act the way it's executed. So um. So then they kind of. I I just want to talk about that real yeah, quick yeah, because yeah. like it's a very back and forth kind of thing because we're going from the mansion to the fucking oh, yeah. the news place or to the press uh, place and then like the newspaper and all that stuff. And it's very che- back and check it on leads basically. Yeah, um, and it's done pretty well, but it is like a slow burn. Oh yeah, uh, crime mystery thing. So while uh, Diane or Mary Warrenoff rather is there with Jeff at the house, he mentions selling them the mansion and we kind of get the dump of like him wanting needing the money and all this stuff but then he's like oh yes she's like oh yeah something weird happened somebody called for my dad who was the mayor right and she's like something about finding a diary in christmas 1935 and they want him to go up to the mansion or any of this stuff give him the message right it was a message message it was a woman (laughs) yeah she even says oh marianne and he's like huh he's like that's weird interesting Right, that's when he starts to kind of go on his uh, his crusade to start investigating and talking to people. And she's like, can I come with you? I'm pushy. Well, beca- well, yeah, that too. And it's like a thing of like where they discover, like there's a whole like thing where Mary Warrenov like is at the newspaper and she's going through all the old press about the, um, the incident. Right. In the mansion. And she finds all of this information about um, how... Marianne, who is this who is the daughter of Wilfred, was murdered or killed rather, and the baby was sent away. And like she's like, How old are you, by the way, Mr. Jeffrey? Right, yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. like, he's like, What do you mean, how old am I? Like, how long have I been on this planet? And it's like, All right, that was a weird way to say that. Well, she's like, Oh yeah, what do you know about your mother? And he's like, Well, they told me she died in a car accident. She's like, Ah, they lied to you. Go read those fucking (laughs) clippings on my desk. So he has this whole thing where he's like reading all the shit and he's like, I've been lied to my whole life. He's like, What the fuck is going on here? You start to kind of feel bad for the guy. Kinda. You don't really know you don't really know how to feel bad. Well, because you're like, All right, well, is he Is he the murderer? Is he the murderer or is he not? You know, is it? Does he actually already know all this? Like, because he even says, "I've never been in that house," yeah. but has he? He's like, "I never, yeah, I never been inside it. It just, it just was left to me." Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So, so Tess gets to the mansion. This is one of the best parts of the movie, yes. in my opinion. Uh, Tess goes in, and it's all dark, right? And the killer has a flashlight, and it's all dark, and the flashlight's oh in her face. Yeah, and they're whispering like this, and they're like, "Hey, Tess." Look, I can see you, but you can't see me. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they're talking about, oh, yeah, you look fatter in the face, but it's you, I can tell. I know it's you, Des. And, like, they're like, come on, Des, take my hand. It's okay. So Tess reach out, and, and you see this hand, and she grabs it, and it's a fucking severed hand. She's like, oh! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just gets the axe, dude. Uh, it's really good. It's, like, one of the most tense best kills of the movie which then we can guess whose hand that actually was yeah. <laughs> later but yeah. uh yeah uh that is kind of one of the best parts of the whole movie for um, sure so of course david Car- or D- jesus christ not david carradine so of course john carradine is, who's the mute guy is the one who's like not having any of it he's right. like he's like wait a second why would tess go to the mansion she's not at the mansion she hates it she hates it this is ridiculous. What's something's fishies here? So uh, Mary Warrenoff stays at the at the press, and um, Jeff and uh, him go to Tessa's house, and then you see all the bird cages and shit. And she's, right, she's not there because he's like, oh, she must be at her house. But then, like John Carradine, like freaks out when he's like, he can't believe she's not there, yeah. and then Jeff keeps saying, well, is, is she at the mansion? Is she at the mansion? And John Carradine just like runs out, like kind of flustered, and like starts the car and just like leaves without him. Le- he leaves I Jeff. Guess. He leaves Jeff in her house, and he like <laughs> grabs a bird. And I'm like, is this guy gonna kill this bird? Well, that was like another thing where it's like, all right, now you're laying on a little thick there, uh, Mr. Director, yeah. sir. But I was like, all right, you're gonna like grab a bird kind of violently, and we're gonna cut. What else do you want me to think? So. You know, we learn a little bit more of the lore of what the deal is. Right. So, so Wilfred's wife Catherine dies. Butler's daughter, Wilfred's butler's daughter, is raped, and then 
and attacked at 15. And Jeffrey, right. Jeffrey's born and he's sent away to California. That's yes. all we know so far. Right. And it's like, oh, that's fucked up. So he has this whole like lineage that he like had no idea about. Yeah. You know, only that he was left like this big giant mansion. So you're like, okay, all right. So then he, Jeff, like, I, don't, I guess he walks back from Tess's house to the press <laughs> and he's he's like, he's like, hey, Mary Warnoff, everybody's at my house except me. Let's go. So they head to the mansion. Man, enough dilly dallying. Let's get to the real plot point here. <laughs> so they, they're driving back to the house and uh, they see John Carradine's car and it's got like, like before you see like the killer like hit it with an axe yeah. and like light it on fire and it like explodes. And they're like, oh my God, that's what's his face, his car. Pre- keep, pressman. Yeah, they keep driving. Yeah. And John Carradine comes out of the fucking woods and they just run him over and he like <laughs> and he, he like, knocks him back like 20 <laughs> feet down he, a ravine. He like rolls down the fucking hill, dude. And then like they get out of the car and this is like one of those scenes that's really dark, but you, you basically know what's happening. Yeah, which would benefit from being cleaned up. Yes. But Jeff kind of goes down there and he's like looking at the body and he says like, oh, his hands are cut off, but you can't. It's so dark you can't see. Yeah. But implying that's what Tess grabbed. Yeah. And he's like, hey, he's dead. And like, uh, and Diane is just like, you fucking killed this you guy. Killed you, you ran this guy over. And he comes back with like blood all over his yeah. hands and his face. He's like, you killed him. You ran him over. And he's like, no, he was like already mostly dead. Which he okay. didn't have any hands. He actually isn't wrong there, yeah. but also is a little too calm about running this guy off the road. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. Uh, get in the car. We got a lot we, of road we, to cover. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's done for it. It's, it. There's nothing yeah. more I could do. Let's go. And she's just like, as you would expect, kind of shell shocked the rest of the ride to the house. But they they pull up, and again, Jeffrey just runs out. You got this police cruiser just sitting there with the lights blaring. Well, Mary won't get out of the car, or Mary Warnoff. Don't blame her. She won't get out of the car, but she's got the pistol on her, and she locks all the doors. He takes the keys, though, and she's like, why did he take the keys? Okay. Well, I don't know. Again, movie's fucking with you. The movie's fucking with you, but it's like, I mean, I take the keys. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You can want her freezing her ass off out there, I guess. Also true. So he goes in there and he finds a diary. But but before we so so that is gonna open up into like the flashback sequence of this film, the, the big right. plot dump, the big lore dump. But before that, I just want we just want to establish that like uh the killer calls so now Mary Warrenov's in the car. The killer calls the house, and now the mayor is home. Her dad is home now home at the same house that they were at. Also, this is actually some pretty clever again cinematography or editing where you just you know the guys in the house. You don't actually see his face. You just see the gloves. Yeah. So you're still like, huh. Is it him or is it not him? Right. But then you're also like, no one else is fucking in there. But let's keep watching. Yeah. But yeah, yeah he calls the mayor. So he right? calls the mayor and he's like, it's me, Marianne. Come to the house. Jeffrey's here. We also have your daughter. Yeah, then he grabs his biggest rifle he can find <laughs> off the wall. <laughs> I was like, fuck, good. He grabs a fucking shotgun. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes to the mansion. So now, so so we cut back to Jeff and he's reading the the uh, the journal that his right. grandfather had left there, which is weird because it's like, it starts going into this VO and Wilford's, it's it's narrated by Wilford and it's like, it's like, uh, yeah, so I'm writing this not for my daughter to see it or for her son Jeffrey to see it, but just because I want to write it down because the movie needs to know what's going on. And like it's a <laughs> long sequence, dude. It's it is too long. I think it's a little long. Uh they do this thing that I think on paper is a good idea, yeah. but the execution not so much where it's kind of like I don't know if they shot it differently or if it's just a whole lot of like bad effects, but they try to make it look older with a sepia Kind of uh, uh yeah, the, 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 the like the, the yellowy orange is the same. Yeah. Uh, they kind of make it look like an older film combined with some camera angle shenanigans, which is kind of cool. But then when it goes on for fifteen minutes, it's like, oh man, this would have been good for like a two minute flashback, but for fifteen, it's losing me. Even if it's ten minutes, it's losing me, man. Like I'm like. <sighs> Not to mention that what is actually being said is just like a little too like dragged out for me. Also, yeah. it's just it's a bad. I was kind of into it up until this point, and then this like flashback, even though it is pertinent information to why everything's happening, is just like it takes way too long to get to the point and just starts to just totally lose me. This is where it doesn't really line up for me because it's right. like this flashback is supposed to be Christmas Eve, nineteen thirty-five. Exactly, exactly. And then nineteen fifty is the other is like where the other event. where Wilford dies, and this is seventy or seventy-two, depending how you want to. And look then the at movie that. takes place in seventy. 
So I don't know. I didn't do the math on it, but something doesn't line up right. No, because like again, I, it's, age is subjective on that, some level. That would but... mean that would mean Jeffrey would need to be born in 1935. So how right. old would he be in 1970? Well, because you get the whole lore dump, even though we kind of just set up what happens. Yeah. It's just basically, well, for talking about, well, I put my daughter in the insane asylum, but all the doctors there are doing bad shit to her and all the other patients, and they're they're evil. And yeah. all the people that work at the hospital are bad bad folks. Well, what happens is he converts his mansion into oh, yeah, the yeah. hospital, uh, right. into an insane asylum, where they can take care of his daughter. And the reason that he has the the doctors come to psychoevaluate his daughter, care of his daughter in air quotes, is because he is the one who fucking raped her and had the baby and then sent the baby to California. Right, but then like there, and he's like, oh, I, I I psychotically broke my daughter, so I needed to, so I hired all these doctors to come and do their research. And right. Then after that, they brought more patients up to the thing. It, it, it's this whole thing where it's like, okay, movie. You want me to feel bad for the guy that causes- Hell no. Like, what do we even do? This is like elves, but like worse. Like, elves at <laughs> least was like, yeah, we're fucking Nazis at least. I took no pleasure in it, but yeah. Wilford did. Uh, Wilford did, and he continued to take pleasure in it. This is like some like warped old boy situation. Like, they both are cognizant of the situation. But also, like, these doctors are way worse because they hurt her, too. But well, I'm going to still keep screwing her, my 15-year-old daughter, on the side. Not true. What? Well, he he goes there at night and does whatever he's going to do. Yeah, right. But, like, the doctors are always reassuring him, like, she's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. The whole thing is they're taking advantage of him and his money by, like, well, the drinking the, day, the most expensive yeah. wine, having these big parties, that's his big, eating that's all what he's the actually food, mad about. staying at the mansion. That's all he gives a shit about. Yeah, he's like, he's yeah. like, these motherfuckers are eating and having a blast on my dime, and my daughter's not better, even though I keep having sex with her. So I put, like, some, like, thing to make them slow, like tranquilizers or something in the food, and I let all the inmates out <laughs> and let them just have their fucking way with the doctors. By, but, but, oops! I forgot to, like, remove my daughter from the situation, and they thought she was one of the people that was, like, hurting them, and they killed her, too. Instead, and probably also did some horrible shit to her in the process. Instead of just poisoning them and well, he, killing them, because he, he's rich. He wanted to have his cake and eat it, too. Like, he could have done that and gotten away with it, yeah. no problem. Instead, he lets out all the inmates. And this scene is really cool, though, because they, like, come in with, like, all yeah. these farm tools. It's, like, bad taste. They come in with all the farm bit. tools. The head the crazy doctor, guy, yeah. he, like, has oh, a, he has a fucking... Uh, the wine. Champagne glass, yeah. and he drinks the champagne and like breaks it and like shoves it into the doctor's eye while he's sleeping. It's pretty great. Again, it's an interesting idea. The visuals are kind of cool, but they're just like stretched out way too yeah. much. It could have been a cool three, four, five minute even sequence, but when it's 10, 15 minutes again, I didn't literally count it out, but yeah. it felt way too long. I don't know why that he. Like maybe they needed to fill that runtime. So then we, well, okay. So 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 the so the inmates kill the doctors right. that are in the house, but then the inmates escape and just leave. So then the thing here is, by letting out the inmates, they kill the doctors, but they also kill his daughter in the process. Right. Well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Then he lets all the inmates leave, and now. He wants revenge on the inmates for killing his daughter that he released to kill the doctors. Right, because spoilers, all the, the <laughs> highfalutin people that have positions of power are actually apparently the insane motherfuckers from the from the nut house that now are the sheriff and the mayor and the woman in charge of communications of the, the telephones in the neighborhood. Not to say that that's an impossible thing that couldn't happen, or maybe there's some kind of weird shit where they actually weren't supposed to be in there and there was some kind of weird fuckery which, where doctors were purposely giving which lobotomies. Happened, which happened a lot then. But like, but that's not where they really go with it. It's just like, no, like they came in and murdered everyone and it was kind of my fault, but because my daughter was a victim also, fuck them, I need revenge 30 years later. Yeah, but like, they just, go and, years they just go and have normal lives? Right. <laughs> what? Like, what no. are you talking, what do you mean? What do you mean they're just like, it's the sheriff and the mayor yeah, and yeah, the guy, yeah. and it's like, but they're fine. Like, they're not like, crazy per se no no it just know? is like uh, uh, you have so many damn hoops you gotta jump yeah. through for it to make sense that i just after the third hoop i just start falling like i give up i'm yeah. like all right movie you had me at like an hour 10 and then like the next 15 happened and i'm like uh, okay i think i think what would have been better is if like the doctors were the townspeople or like mm. they helped in some way and like the she ended up going crazy like the daughter went up going crazier from like being 
constantly having uh, sex with her dad, uh, um, and then she killed herself. Like that would have been more. And then like then he would blame them, right? But then we kind of come back to reality, and now like Jeffrey, at least this is the way I read it. It kind of has a bit of a breakdown from having this revelation, and now it's like. I don't know, dressed like a bellhop or something. I don't really understand he's got this a cape. scene. He, he looks like the fucking family of the opera. But yeah. like the realization that he's like, my grandpa's also my dad. Right. My my grandpa's my own my dad. The master yeah. race. Yeah, yeah. There the is that. Huta. Uh but also then like now the mayor's there with the shotgun, and there's kind of like this weird situation where he comes in and he's like, Oh, Jeffrey, and they immediately shoot each other. And they both kill each other. Literally. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, is that the end? <laughs> well, Diane's watching all this, by the way. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's like there. So like, she's like, oh my God, my dad is shot and he's dead. Oh my God, Jeff, you're also handsome and I guess I was going to hook up with you later, but now you're dead too? Yeah. And then- uh, And then we get the fucking reveal. This is the uh, twist. I, which I guess they kind of already, they talk about it in the flashback. They do, they do talk about that, it. That, oh yeah, actually I didn't burn alive. That was just somebody else. That, that... was Joe Pesci yeah. and I faked my death. <laughs> yeah, that was Harry Lime. <laughs> Uh, that was Joe Petto or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I faked my death that I've been using an alias. And then and I'm going to- checking myself into mental institutions under different names uh, and staying there uh, while I hide out? He needed uh, three square meals and a hot cot, I guess. I, there you go. Uh, and he didn't want to go to prison. So then he walks down mm. the stairs. And again, like I, age is whatever. We thought Buzz was, was 18. He's like 15. I don't know. But this man, I swear to God, in 35, 1935, looked like 60 years old. He had to have been at least- least 40 something in let's just say 40 there's no fucking way this guy was doing the things and not that happens in a lot of these movies that's where like it doesn't some, line up at the end but like this some, really doesn't that's like some michael myers shit like coming back 40 years well, later the, you know what yeah I mean? yeah in, in the you'd be you'd be yeah. decrepit and like I mean, unless you, I don't know what, unless he's working out, he's taking his vitamins, he's eating his vegetables. He's got more hair on his head than he does in the flashback. Well, it also has like a Norman Bates kind of thing because the flashback in the beginning yeah. for when that guy dies, the, when Joe Pesci dies outside, that was the fake guy. Right. And then you see like this old lady playing a fucking, uh, what do you call it? An organ. Organ, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's wearing the shawl and the, and the uh, what do you call oh, it? Oh, like that was supposed to be him, I guess? That was supposed to be him, question mark. I don't know. It's not very clear. No, but he also thinks that he's Marianne as well. So yeah, he, but then also then when he sees Diane, like as she's trying to run away from him, he's picturing her as Marianne. And he's that's like, why my he, daughter. Yeah, but then she just has that revolver and just fucking unceremoniously unloads on him. She doesn't even blink. She fucking lights this dude up. She shoots him like five times. And he just dies. He just falls over like a fucking bag of potatoes. Yeah. Dead. That's a hell of a lot of dead people all around. Uh, I guess that was the most realistic part of the whole movie was yeah. when she just unloaded on him. Yeah. But uh, then it just kind of comes to a close. Yeah, it's like Mary Warren off again. And she's like, and that's the story of what happened. It was really fucked up. But now they're not in the mansion down but you know what I'll never forget Silent Night Bloody Night TM Night of the Dark Moon Dark House yeah right too coming yeah. soon <laughs> uh, so all right, so so it's trash into the snow baby yes what present is this under our trees I'm gonna keep this one simple okay this is coal coal this is fucking coal coal yeah, it's cold. cold. I, I can't really overthink this one okay. because it, it's one. You That's know, very extreme. Maybe like, it's not even like the worst thing I've ever seen. So maybe I, I could think of worse stuff. You know, I could just say dog shit on fire. But well, like, I think coal, at least you could maybe in theory do something with that. You could light it on oh, fire. Oh yeah, if you keep, get, to keep warm. Get a little warm from it. Yeah. You could sell it. Put you it know. in your in your train. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't really think this one through too much. Point being is you reach in that stocking expecting to get a little candy, maybe some jewelry, mm -hmm. maybe some uh, iTunes gift cards if if the folks are still buying those in, in 2023. <laughs> Apple Podcasts. Oh, there you go. Apple yeah. Podcast gift cards to buy the Movie Dumpster episodes. Yes. Uh, Wait, they're free. If you're reaching into the stocking to get those little knickknacks that are usually in there, and and you grab some coal, you're going to be like, what fucking year is this? But you're going to be like, I guess I could use this. And if you can't think of anything to use it for, you just throw it the fuck out. And that's kind of how I feel about okay. this movie. Uh, it has a good thing going for it for a, a large chunk of this runtime. So I still will say it's worth watching. However, that last, like, again, 20 minutes where they start to really start to explain everything, the wheels just totally fall off. And then, like, the final five are just like, yeah, by the way, we need to wrap this the fuck up. Everyone's yeah. dead. 
Sorry. I wish they took a little bit more time to do the ending part. Like shorter, shorter plot dump or shorter lore dump and longer end end portion. I, I yeah, I agree. I, I do wonder if there's just a case of we need to get this runtime to a certain point, or if there's combining of script ideas. Because it almost feels like another movie is inserted at the end here. It's only a buck twenty five, this movie. It's a, it's a breeze. It makes me think of it, and it's not even comparable, like Meet the Feebles, where they have that whole Vietnam sequence, but there's actually like a reason why they did it the way they did it from a, from a financial standpoint to kind of go around the system a little bit. And sure. Actually, is very successfully well done. But that's what I think of. That's that's a good way to go about that's that. That's a really weird, you know what I mean, though? reaching example. But yeah, I guess I'm just so. thinking, like, in the context of Meet the Feebles, they, like, technically made another movie and inserted it into their film, and it's great. This is, like, my thought process is, well, we made this flashback that we didn't know what to put it in, so we're which like, is, which, no, which was put like, it in this thing, But I it's, guess. like, also integral to the plot to, like, yeah, so get like, the whole story out. So my analogy to you, or whatever you want to call whatever I just said, just totally falls to shit. <laughs> but I'm just trying to, like, throw this movie a bone, I guess, is why I even go there with Meet the Feebles. Uh, but uh, what about this movie specifically is redeeming? I I think the cinematography is really redeeming. I think the kills are redeeming. And I think again, the the first two thirds of this are really good. Yeah. Uh, but that ending just kind of sullies the whole film for me. And that, that does happen. Occasionally you watch a movie and you're really into it. And the ending just kind of ruins the whole thing for you. Mm. Uh, it just kind of is one of those for me. Maybe, maybe Cole, I could, I could probably, if I really sat here and thought about it, I could think of a better example, but Cole's the first thing that popped in my mind. Uh, you can light it. It's gonna let. It's gonna keep you warm for a while, but eventually, that coal's gonna go out, and it's just gonna be a lump of shit just sitting there. And that's kind of what this movie is. It it kept me warm for a while. It went out, and uh, it left me cold. There you go. I got to it. Joe. There, you, there you go, man. I like collecting like old camera stuff. Not necessarily things I'm gonna use, mm. but um, like old lenses and and old like makes of cameras and stuff. Um, and. I think that that I'll never use it, but it's cool to have, and it's a relic from the past and how they used to do things or how they used to use these things, and I think that's cool. I think the history with the with that thing is cool, and I do appreciate that gift, and I think it's cool, and I will put it on my shelf and as, as a piece to remember the bygone era of how it was done. And that's kind of how I feel about Silent Night, Bloody Night. I'm actually going to add this to my rotation. Okay. Um... The the thing with this is Black Christmas is better and just does everything that this movie does better. Yeah. That's not to say that this movie isn't an important film in the pantheon of not only Christmas horror movies, but slasher movies. We wouldn't have Black Christmas without Silent Night, Bloody Night. You know what I mean? Just yeah. much like we wouldn't have Halloween without Black Christmas. You know what I mean? So um, I think it's a pivotal point where where we really shifted gears into a more grisly, not convoluted, but 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 heavily uh, uh, like story heavy, story heavy kind of like what's the deal with the killer and okay. and all of these like plot points and and all that kind of stuff. Um, again, this is a this is a pro. This is not the first proto, but it is part of the proto lineage of slashers and how we got from A to B. Um, and I think it does a lot of things that were essential to the more contemporary stuff that we have now. So um, I think there's a lot of great cinematography in this. Again, this needs this really could benefit from a cleanup. I know that it's in public domain. So, but like, if you get a print, like I, I would really love to see this like really like uh, cleaned up. Color corrected, all of that stuff, because I think it deserves it. There's a lot of great stuff in this movie. There's a lot of really good cinematography. I love the the killer uh, making the phone calls with the yeah. whisper and all that stuff. When there when there's gore and there's um, kills, it really delivers. They're a little few and far between, but that's not really what this movie's nah, about. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Much like Black Christmas, it's not necessarily about all the right. kills, but when they come, it's shocking. You know. Um, Again, this walked so Black Christmas can run, um, but I think this is a essential watch if you're a fan of the slasher genre and if you want to see um, the early beginnings of a lot of um, kind of how the slasher genre evolved. You know what I mean? I think this is I think this is a really good one to put in there, especially Christmas uh, yeah. slasher movies. So um, it has this great uh, gothic horror feel to it as well, almost like an Amicus or, or Hammer movie, um, which I guess 
was pretty popular at the time too. Um, so it kind of fits that bill, but it feels really good, especially for a slasher movie. Yeah, I think I think it's really good. Um, uh, I think it's an important film. Um, like I said, so yeah, that that's pretty much it. But before you head out of here, if you want to get yourself some more movie dumpster content, you can head over to patreon.com slash movie dumpster. Get yourself an ad free version of the show, the audio version of the show for two dollars. That's it. Two dollars a month. Less than a cup of coffee. And uh, we got some more stuff on there for five and ten dollar tiers. Get yourself some watch alongs where we watch a movie with you dumpster dwellers. And we got a whole archive on and we got commentary tracks and other bonus videos. Patreon.com slash movie dumpster. Check it out. Yeah, man. And for no money at all, you can do it. You, a Christmas miracle. It's a Christmas gift, if you will. You can like this video if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe if you haven't. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast app, leave us that five-star review because it really helps the show. Gets it out of the bottom of the dumpster, into more eyeballs, into more eardrums. And, uh, you know, we grow this dumpster community, so we could really use your help with that. And if you want to keep up with what's going on with the Dumpster Boys, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster uh, anywhere on social media or head over to MovieDumpsterPodcast.com to get updates on the show, find out what events we're going to be at coming up, and other little things like uh, updates on our store, new shirt designs and hats, stuff like that. So check it out, MovieDumpsterPodcast.com. So that's it. That's Silent Night, Bloody Night from 1972, directed by Theodore Gershney. I'm Joel Escola. And I'm Sean O'Rourke. Thanks for visiting the dumpster.